Today I'm gonna to take you behind the scenes of this photo and the who, what, where, when, why, and how we created it. This is specifically a natural light photo shoot, which if you've spent any time on this channel, you know that's a little something different for me. Hey there, I'm Joni Simon, food photographer. Welcome to my studio and welcome to The Bite Shot. This is where I share the things that I've learned on my food photography journey in hopes that it helps you on yours. And like I said, today we are diving into a natural light photo Photo shoot. I 99% of the time these days I'm shooting with artificial light and with strobes and LEDs and all that stuff but we're kind of taking it back to basics back to the beautiful free natural light in hopes that you pick up some new tricks and maybe a greater understanding of working in natural light. But before we do that I want to say a big thank you to today's sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring and creative classes for anyone who loves learning. Now, if you haven't checked out Skillshare before, it's definitely a go-to for me when I'm learning something new. Recently, I wanted to start learning Adobe After Effects to really help me in my video editing and especially for stop motion animation, which I've gotten into in the last couple years. I was looking for different lessons in education online, but a lot of them were kind of starting at this level when I was like, no, I I need something like <laughs> literally breaking it down, the most basic, simple, get me started. And fortunately, Skillshare was there to the rescue. I found they had a huge library of After Effects lessons, including learn the basics of Adobe After Effects to create a moving portrait with Halis Narvaez. She breaks it down in a way that was easy to follow and did not make me feel dumb and made me excited to start using the new skills right away. From navigating the interface to understanding keyframing, which was such an amazing moment to really fully understand that. And I love that as an industry professional, she is sharing best practices so that I can start to incorporate these things into my workflow and know that I am providing a professional service to my clients. And as an educator myself, I appreciate how well organized the content is, how easy it is to follow. She gets straight to the point, no extra fluff, so that I can get the information that I need and start creating right away. You know that I'm a firm believer in continuing education, lifelong learning, and Skillshare is a wonderful way to invest in yourself and your personal growth. So go ahead to my link in the description box below or use the code THEBITESHOT when signing up to get one month free trial of Skillshare. So thank you again so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now let's go behind the scenes. So like I said, we're gonna go through the who, what, when, where, why, and how, so that we can go through kind of all the different aspects of this photo shoot. So starting off with who was there? Well, it was myself, of course, as the photographer, and I was working with Brendan McCaskey, who is a food stylist who I work with frequently for several different clients. And this particular photo shoot, though, was just a really fun opportunity for us to get together, to collaborate together, to create some images that we felt compelled and called to create, that we wanted something bold and expressive, super colorful, maybe outside the norm of what we typically create for clients. So I would say this is much more of a personal shoot. There was no specific client other than you, you here on YouTube. Now in terms of connecting with food stylists, there's a number of different ways to go about that. There are listings online, which I'll link one of the helpful directories down below. But I actually first connected with Brendan via some mutual connections connections in the local Phoenix food scene over five years ago. And we didn't though start working together until about a year ago, maybe even less than a year ago, because of a client who had hired me, also hired him, brought him in to do the food styling. We connected, we hit it off. He's got a great sense of style, a wonderful background. He's actually trained as a chef, was where he got started, worked in restaurants for many years, worked at a really nice fine dining restaurant actually here in Phoenix that was all about farm to table. And so his styling is definitely like driven by use of beautiful ingredients and he has a real attention to detail. I would say also that years of having worked in the restaurant industry means that he is quick at problem solving, quick on his feet and not easily rattled. Not that I create some sort of really intense, hardcore working environment when we're on a shoot together for a client, but certainly when things go wrong or when something unexpected happens, the fact that he's worked for years on a restaurant kitchen line, like nothing phases him. He is cool under pressure. Now, one thing to keep in mind when working with food stylists that I didn't understand kind of when I first started out as a food photographer is that different stylists have different strengths and different expertise and different 
things that they are known for. Just like photographers, that certain photographers get hired for different things that they are good at. Maybe you're particularly good at editorial style or advertising or bold expressive colors or something more muted and nuanced, right? We have all of our own unique skills and experiences. Likewise, the same for stylists. So I definitely recommend, you know, especially if you're bringing a stylist into a particular shoot, is being familiar with their portfolio. They should have an online portfolio website just like you do as a working photographer to be able to see what is it that they've done before, what is the style, what are their strengths, and also asking them questions about the kind of work that they enjoy doing. And so Brendan definitely has that eye for the editorial style, which really lent well toward what we were creating here today. So then moving on to what? What was it that we were photographing? What was the overall concept? Like I mentioned, we wanted something really bold and expressive and super colorful. So pulling from that green backdrop that we used and made in the DIY backdrops video that that's what we used then for this kebab shoot. And so how did we then decide on kebabs? Well, that was actually thanks to a poll that I ran on the community tab on YouTube asking, which would you rather see a shoot? kebabs or meatloaf? And I was shocked. I was fairly certain that folks would have it in for us and want to see us do meatloaf, which admittedly is hard. And we will, we will do meatloaf. Don't worry, we'll get there. But kebabs went out, so kebabs it was. So in planning for the shoot, Brendan and I got on a call together and I said, okay, it's gonna be kebabs and here's kind of some inspiration images that I've pulled of some different ideas, but then kind of really getting input from him to see you know, what would get him excited, what kind of flavors would be fun, what kind of ingredients would he get excited about. And so it was really a collaborative effort. So where we landed was chicken. We felt like there was a lot of beef out there. So like, let's switch it up and do chicken. And Brendan marinated it in this beautiful, like cumin and chili infused marinade and then pairing that up with a lot of really fun accoutrement and different colorful items kind of thinking about the kebabs themselves they don't have a ton of color certainly we wanted the grill marks to be on there and to have that char be very visible but then to add a lot of color thinking about like a red harissa sauce which added some punch and flavor and then one of the things that I love that Brendan does is you know any sort of like green sauce or salsa verde he's very very particular about ingredients and where he gets them from. So everything is super fresh. And so this like super vibrant green sauce we knew just visually was gonna be very exciting to look at, but also to eat and enjoy because we did enjoy this for lunch that same day. And then one of the inspiration images that I had pulled had some kind of flatbread in it. So Brendan being extra as he is, decided to make his own flatbread, you know, get yourself a stylist who's like committed to that next level, right? We did a shoot of a crudité platter a number of months ago and we wanted sort of those little like breadstick batons and he couldn't find any at the store so he made his own. I'm like, you are amazing. And then we had some saffron rice for a little bit of extra color because he could have done a plain rice but the saffron imparting that little bit of extra yellow to it. And then he also introduced me to labna which I had had before but wasn't super familiar with how it was made. So I just took Greek yogurt and put it in a cheesecloth to let it drain so it thickens it up so it's like extra super creamy and then just drizzling some oil and some chilies over that and tons of little extra bits and bobbles and a little accoutrement that we could throw in there and then coming in with just like a really fun unique vibrant punch of color and one of our favorite ingredients that I feel like makes it into a lot of the shoots that we do is watermelon radish it just adds that little bit of extra pink which has sort of this like floral quality to help soften what's otherwise like a pretty intense and punchy kind of scene overall, but the pink just sort of subtly softens it. And then as far as props, I have a fairly large collection of props here at the studio, but Brendan likewise is also a props fanatic. He is a fellow friend in props addiction and we enable each other way too much, but he brought some different props that we've been wanting to use that we haven't had a chance to. And so especially too, in thinking about our hero, the kebabs themselves, what to serve those on, he brought these two different platters and ultimately we went with this kind of more organic feeling one. It had a really 
interesting textures from Pottery Barn. But anytime Brendan and I work together, and I think pretty much the case with all the local food stylists who I work with here in Phoenix, that when it comes to props, it's usually a very collaborative effort that we're sort of both interjecting ideas and thoughts and kind of bouncing back and forth between the two of us as to what's going to be the right prop for the scene, the overall mood, and really create a great image in the end. So that's the who, the what, so then the when. Well, because we're shooting in natural light, obviously this is taking place during the day, but I count both Brendan and I very fortunate that we get to call this work our day job, so that wasn't too much of a stretch for us. We typically work together during the day regardless of if it's natural or artificial light. So then where we shot was here in my studio, which for a little backstory on this studio, if you spent time on this channel or you've seen some of the older videos, you know that we were not always in this space. This is attached to my house. Uh, it's connected by a little bit of a breezeway, but it is sort of freestanding from the rest of the house but we broke ground on this in June of 2020, took about a year to build, and now we've been using it and working in it and kind of refining the workflow in this space for the better part of a year. It continues to be just a dream come true to have this space and to get to have plenty of elbow room and a great space for Brendan to be able to cook his amazing food in. But now admittedly, I am always hesitant to talk about this space because I don't want you to think that you have to have a space like this in order to do food photography or or have a successful business that I started out just like most folks in the food photography space, or a lot of folks, not most, but a lot, started out at my kitchen table with my family. Yes, I was the goofball with a C stand in my kitchen. People would come over for dinner and they're like, What's all this equipment? Like, this just becomes a part of life, right? But then I moved into the spare bedroom in the house, and then we took over and built in our back patio, which was where I was for the better part of like the three, first three years of this channel. And so this has definitely been an evolution, a process of building. This did not happen overnight, but I would say I've shot plenty of cookbooks and lots of campaigns and lots of other amazing projects and worked for amazing clients in not a space like this. Like this is not required by any stretch of the imagination. So I just wanna make sure that that's perfectly clear. I mean, the stories I could tell, I'm sure you've got stories as well about working in teeny tiny spaces and in all sorts of challenging environments and situations. But ultimately those kinds of situations make you a stronger and better photographer. But anyway, hopping off my soapbox, we ended up shooting in front of a north facing sliding glass door that I have here in the studio. Now, if you know things about lighting and you watched last week's video about the DIY backdrops, you're like, wait, wait a minute, Joni, hold up. Wasn't that shot in hard light? And what you're going to get out of this north facing window is definitely soft light, or at least we think is going to be soft light, right? What happened? What's going on? Well, we actually shot this scene twice. We shot it once in the hard light with artificial lighting, and then we shot it in the soft light that's being produced by this north facing window. And so then you're like, well, why didn't you just shoot the natural light? shot in hard light. Why didn't you pick a window that produces hard light? Well, when we built this studio, again, I rely so heavily on artificial lighting, I wasn't really super concerned in terms of the windows themselves. And so we actually only have north and south facing windows here in the studio. Now, if you're not familiar with the way that windows work and the way that lighting works relative to the cardinal directions that our windows face, is that when we want to create a hard light look, it's all about having a direct line of sight of the sun. That if you have your subject placed on the table in the window, if the sun kind of directly lines up and like you could look out, draw a line straight from your subject to the sun, there's a direct line that's direct light, that that's going to create hard light, which creates this really kind of fun, sort of summery, vibey look, right? But that situation's only going to happen in an east facing window in the morning or in a west facing window in the afternoon. And so being that I don't have any east or west facing windows, I don't have the opportunity for direct sunlight coming in through my windows. I only have north and south. And if you think about just the orientation of north and south facing windows is that the sun is always going to be overhead of the building. Now, it may be kind of coming in more from an angle or other sides, but ultimately you're not ending up with that direct line of sight to the sun. You're getting indirect lighting. And when we're dealing with indirect lighting, we're gonna get softer light in comparison to direct light. Additionally, this is also a 
really large window. And when we talk about the physics of light and how light behaves, is that the larger the light source, the larger the window, the softer the lighting is gonna be. So if this was a smaller window, or I could even make it smaller by maybe closing the curtains a bit, or using black cards or boxing it in, that the size of that window, again, relative to our subject though, is gonna also contribute to the hardness or softness of the lighting on the scene. And so if you absolutely adore soft lighting and that's what you're going for, what you're gonna to wanna to look for is a north or south facing window with indirect light and a really large window. That's gonna give you that super soft look, which we are actually getting here in this scene today. Now as an additional little hot tip about shooting with windows and in natural light is also being mindful of what's right outside the window, that if there is some sort of awning that has a color to it or if there is a ton of greenery or there is something else that is a vibrant color that is outside and that light is reflecting up off of into your window that may cause some color cast issues in your scene. Now for me we have yet to landscape the backyard so it's all just still barren earth and dirt and it's Arizona and it's dry and nothing naturally lives out there until you plant it and water it so we don't really have a ton of issues with additional color cast popping up off there maybe like a little hint of brown but you know, that's my ode to Arizona. Whenever people visit from the Pacific Northwest and they come to Phoenix for the first time, they're like, it's just so brown. And then I go to Portland and I'm like, it's so green. <laughs> But so we decided on this window, I set up my two saw horses. If you wanna learn more about my recommendations for tables shooting on, I've got a past video about that that I'll link down below, but popped in the two saw horses, popped in that DIY backdrop that I made in the previous video, and then we started cooking and started styling. And when I say we, I mean Brendan. <laughs> So then moving on to the why, and I'm sitting here trying to anticipate questions that may come up in your mind as to why, why did she do that? So first thing that there's always a lot of questions about is the C-stand that I am using to mount the camera overhead. And I have a whole video about that if you wanna check that one out. But I love to mount my cameras overhead for these top-down shots, primarily because I'm lazy and old and I don't wanna keep jumping up over the scene. <laughs> I just wanna put it up there and it's solid and then it allows me the freedom then to be behind the workstation. I do prefer to shoot tethered. I've got an updated video all about tethering coming up soon, so stay tuned for that. But I like to be then behind the workstation, really being able to see in real time what's happening in this scene, that I don't have to continue to keep jumping up and down and jumping up and down until I get what it is that I'm looking for. This also really makes it so much easier in collaborating with somebody else, working with a stylist, that not only am I seeing the scene in real time, but also Brendan seeing the scene in real time, that he can make tweaks and changes because he can see exactly what I can see, that we can work together on that. And so then maybe another question that you might have is why I decided the direction that the light would come from in the scene. And so for me, when it comes for top-down shots, overhead shots, I have a personal preference for the light entering from the top of the frame or maybe the top corners. But honestly, most often that direct top overhead, I've run lots of tests over the years, kind of having the light coming in from different angles and different sides and things like that for top down. And for me personally, I just have a really strong personal preference for the light to come in directly from the top. Now, certainly if I'm shooting hard light, then maybe I'll kind of play around with angles and things like that because of the shadows that get cast and getting to have some shadow play. But in this case, I really like it coming in from the top. Also just psychologically, I heard somebody say this at one point, can't remember who it was, but the psychological impact of your viewer looking at a top-down scene and seeing that shadow at the bottom of the frame, it feels more natural because that's where their body would physically be placed if looking over the top of this scene, that you would be casting a shadow, kind of blocking light from the bottom of the frame. So making again sense why the light is coming in from the top or the sides. If you've never tested out this theory before or don't think you necessarily have a personal preference towards the way the light enters from a top-down scene, I'd highly suggest you experiment with it. Try it, like set up a scene and then kind of move it around, move around the perspective, or if you're shooting with artificial, move the light around from different sides and see if you have a strong preference for where you like the light to enter into the scene. And so then maybe another why that you're asking is what's up with the black card, that black piece of foam core that I added at the top of the frame, kind of closest to the window. So as we were setting 
setting up the scene and I was looking at the lighting, I noticed that certainly it was brightest at the top of the frame and that the light sort of falls off down towards the bottom of the scene, which is absolutely predictable, makes sense, there's no surprises there. But in thinking about the composition, and lighting is certainly an important component of composition. I have a whole series about composition, I'll link that as well down below. But in thinking about composition, our eye is most naturally drawn immediately to the brightest area in the scene. And so typically we want our eyes, our viewer's eyes, to go to the subject first. So making our subject the brightest thing inside the scene. And so right now, kind of the top of the frame, that barren space where, you know, there's a little couple props and other things going on up there, but that is kind of pulling focus to a degree because of the brightness away from our subject. So by placing that black card, it is is blocking off the light hitting kind of the top of the frame on the surface, but it's not blocking the light. It's not so tall that the light is not reaching then our subject. It creates just this sort of nice little vignette across the top of the frame. Now you could certainly achieve this in post by adding maybe graduated filters or some other edits to your image, but I really like to get things close in camera because of just the way that light naturally behaves, allow it to behave the way that it behaves so that this looks natural, that it doesn't look fake. And as far as like what foam core actually is, like that's what they call it. It's like a really thick kind of poster board material. You can buy it at office supply stores, craft supply stores, Amazon. What I do is I just cut it down to the size that I need. Now I very often insert a little strip on overhead shots like this to that similar size. I use this in my artificial lighting shots, I use this in natural lighting shots. So this particular size I use often, so I don't have to keep cutting it down. This is just sort of that standard block the top of the frame one. And I help hold it up by just using an A clamp, which again, Amazon, or you can get these at the hardware store, just a nice little A clamp, which just helps hold it into place and keep it steady at the top of the frame. So then finally moving on to the how, how did we capture this? What camera, what lens, what camera settings? So I am using my go-to to standard stills camera is the Nikon Z7. When I talk about cameras and why to go with one camera or another, there's nothing explicitly unique or special about the Z7 that makes it better for food photography. I have a whole video about which cameras and what to know about the different brands and why to pick one camera over another. I would say if you are looking for your first camera, I would not recommend the Z7, not because it's not an amazing camera. Unless you have an unlimited budget, then absolutely go for it. But otherwise, go for for something that is inside of your budget because you don't necessarily know at the beginning and the outset of your journey what camera is going to best fit the needs that you have. You don't know what needs you have yet. You haven't gone down that path yet. So the Z7 for me and the needs that I have and the preferences that I have, that most naturally lends towards those and I've been super duper happy with that camera. You'll have to pry it out of my cold dead hands to get it away from me. And then shooting with the 24 to 70 F 2.8 S lens from Nikon as well. The Z mount is my favorite lens. A 24 to 70, pretty much any top down shot that I have captured in the last four years, whether that be with the Canon 5D Mark IV that I shot with for years or my Z7, it's always been the 24 to 70 for overheads because of the flexibility of being able to adjust the focal length that I've got the camera mounted overhead on the C stand and then I can just zoom in, zoom out to the focal length that's gonna fit that overhead scene the best. And so I ended up at a 30 millimeter focal length for this particular setup. Now, likewise, along the same lines of what we just talked about with the camera bodies, same goes for lenses, that just because I love the 24 to 70 does not mean you will love the 24 to 70, and additionally does not mean that you should go out and buy one, especially considering how expensive that lens is, that you can absolutely get away with and use and have great success with the kit lens that comes with your camera, maybe an 18 to 55 millimeter, that that has 30 millimeters in its focal length range. So you could absolutely still accomplish a great overhead shot with a kit lens or with another lens. One thing though that I did come across recently that may be worth checking out is there are lots of different 
online rental options for lenses. A friend of mine just recently borrowed, rented a lens that she needed for a particular shoot. She doesn't want to invest in the lens like it's a $2,000 lens. She's like, I don't have that right now, but for a hundred bucks, she was able to rent a lens, get that cost covered as part of the shoot that she was doing and had a lot of fun, a great opportunity to try out gear that you don't know if you necessarily want to go spend that kind of money on. I'll link the resource that she used down below in case you're curious. So then as far as camera settings, if you are familiar with operating your camera in manual mode, if you're not, I have a whole series that'll walk you through learning manual mode, but I always start with aperture is what I'm setting first because in this particular situation, we're shooting top down. And for this shot, I wanted focus to be from all the way from the bottom, from that surface, all the way up to the highest item in the scene, which in this case was kind of roughly around kind of the top of the chicken skewers or the top of that sauce, kind of basing the focus there and knowing that I had enough depth of field in order to have all of that be in focus based on my aperture. So I selected F9, which gave me enough depth of field, enough wideness there in order to capture everything in focus. But shooting at F9 in natural light means that then I am going to need to compensate for the lack of brightness because the opening at F9, not super wide, right? Limiting the amount of light coming into the scene. And so I need either a slower shutter speed or a higher ISO, which I actually did a combination of the both in order to compensate for the brightness. So for the shutter speed, I went down to 1 30th of a second. I could have gotten away with slower, but I do admittedly still get nervous when shooting in natural light, continuous lighting scenarios. Even though the camera is mounted, even though everything is nice and still, even though we are on a solid floor and nothing's shaking, the table's not shaking, but I still do worry about camera shake and I don't want to, that to contribute to any sort of blur in the scene. So down to 1 30th of a second was about as like low, as slow as I felt comfortable going with in this situation. I probably could have gotten away with going slower, but then I compensated with a higher ISO. So increasing the ISO because I did know shooting with this particular camera, a lot of our modern cameras released within the last couple of years, mirrorless cameras do have better low light performance, perform better at higher ISOs. And so I knew I could get away with a thousand ISO and not have an issue with grain or additional noise that I didn't want. So that's where I ultimately landed. F9, 1 30th of a second, ISO 1000 for a properly exposed image, or at least the exposure that I was going for. I'd say the right way is the way that you want to do it. And then Brendan and I working together collaboratively, just making little touch-ups on the scene, adding little extra shimmer by brushing that on the chicken, just kind of checking things out, adjusting composition, getting everything perfectly dialed in, getting that final shot and giving ourselves a nice old pat on the back and a super high five. And so I'd love to know at this point what questions you have, what things maybe didn't make sense in what I just walked through, or things that you saw that maybe you would have done differently, because that's the beauty of food photography, right? Is that we all have our own unique perspectives and ways of doing things, but we can absolutely learn from each other in ways that we can maybe adapt our process or look at things from a different perspective. So certainly feel free to share down in the comment section below. But as always, thank you so much for stopping by the studio to hang out with me today and Brendan. And thank you to Brendan for hanging out with me too. And thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Use that promo code, the bite shot for your free trial. But thanks again, as always, you have a fantastic day. You stay out of trouble and I'll see you soon. All right. Bye.